So good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Rob Allen, and I'm very um, honored to be moderating the NetLod meeting today. Um, my job is basically to keep us on schedule, moderate the Q&A session, and to make sure we get to the uh, coffee breaks and lunch on time, and also to the social this evening. And so um, we are a bit early, but um, I think it's time for the first presentation of the NetLod meeting. Um, and the first two presenters today are going to be James Tucker and Hugo Kosbach. Uh, James is the Director of Systems Engineering at Baffin Bay Networks. He's been working in security since 2006, specializes in network security and particularly interested in intrusion prevention and web security. Uh, he's worked as a security engineer for several vendors in the Nordics over the 10 years, and today he manages sales engineering at Baffin Bay Networks. Hugger, um, very well known to many of you in this room, is a network architect working for the Scandinavian Research and Education Network, NordUnet specializing in high-capacity network design, routing in the DFZ, long-haul optical networking, and interconnect strategy and relations. So please um, join me in welcoming um, Hugger and James to the stage. Thank you. I'll sit over here, James, and you can just start. Are you sure? Yeah, I can do my presentation as well, so I don't have to. It's okay. <laughs> Just joking. Wait till you see Hoogie's presentation. I don't think I want that my name associated with it. Um, so, since we have extra time, I can actually tell you guys who I am. Uh, my name is James Tucker. Uh, I've been living here in Sweden, working uh, for various security vendors for the past almost 11 years. Yo kan faktisk prata svenska. Ha, Hoogie. Oh, thank you. I got a cheer for that. Wow, that's the first time. Um, and I know some of you guys are like, oh, the vendor, uh, sponsor, coffee guys are going to talk. So we're just going to give you guys 87 slides about everything about our product and a long product demo so you guys can check your emails. Okay. <laughs> you guys are like, yeah, that sounds great. Um, now, Hoogie and I talked, and uh, what we really want to do is uh, talk a little bit more about the strategy and the things that we did when we started building this company in order to uh, provide you guys with something interesting, something that you might actually walk away and learn something from. Um, so how many of you in this room have heard of us? Holy, yes, go marketing budget. <laughs> All right, um, so you guys uh, who didn't raise your hands, it's okay, we're not mad. Uh, we are a fairly new, fully funded security startup based uh, here in Stockholm. Uh, as you can tell by my accent. Um, and uh, we currently sit at SUP46 uh, down on Regeringsgatan. You're all invited for uh, ping pong or foosball. No, I hate ping pong. I'm, I know that's very un-Swedish, but I hate ping pong and nobody plays foosball with me. Um, so at our core, what we do is we provide a cloud-based DDoS mitigation service, right? But that is largely uninteresting to the vast majority of you in this room. And what we really want to do is provide something that's more than just DDoS insurance, right? For those two or three days a year, the typical customer will have some sort of denial of service event. So our platform is also built with uh, threat detection, so kind of IPS and uh, anti-malware and a couple of additional bells and whistles, as well as uh, web application protection all built in to our uh, threat protection centers, our kind of scrubbing centers that Hoog is going to talk about a little bit, um, in, a, in a single pass architecture. And so talking to Hoog, and just so you guys know, Hoog is my model for what I assume everybody in this room is like. So I assume you're all kind of bitter and grumpy. Uh, <laughs> so I kind of thought you guys would be at this point right now, right? Um, is this going to be interesting? And, and I hope the answer will be yes, right? I, I suspect, again, Hoogie being my model, the rest of you are thinking something like this. Hey, it's 2018. Why are you guys making a new company that does DDoS mitigation, right? Are you guys crazy, stupid, or both? And I say, probably both, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but what I'm going to talk about is not uh, necessarily the... The, the product itself, our solution, how it works. But I want to talk more about the strategy behind it, because I think that is the key differentiator in terms of how we think we are unique and what we actually offer to our customers, right? 
So what we, th this is the line that our uh, CTO, or our CEO, gave to me when he said, uh, Jim, I want you to come and work with us, right? We're gonna work on not just the DDoS part, but we also wanna look at that application, uh, application layer stuff. The things that, I, my background's in IPS, so those are the kind of things that I tend to think about, right? Uh, I work a lot with enterprise security, and this is a much more interesting prospect for me, right? And I think it makes us neat. Um, and again, Hoogie being my model, I think that some of you are like, hey, well, what makes you guys such uh, special snowflakes, right? And I think strategy is the key answer. How many of you are familiar with this number? How many of you know exactly what this is, right? You guys don't ha get marketing emails from any of the other vendors out there, right? <laughs> so this uh, was all over the place earlier in the year when we saw the, the memcache attacks in terms of the largest DDoS attack in history. And I, I need to make sure I'm really clear when I'm talking about this because I've, I've presented this number before and I I've, don't think I've been clear. Yeah, this, this is scary, but when we look at the typical customer who needs to buy some sort of DDoS mitigation, is this the most important thing they need to worry about, right? Probably not, right? At this point, the internet uh, people in this room, we all hold hands even if we're uh, competitors, we sing kumbaya and we try to solve this problem because this is a problem for everybody, right? Transit providers go down, it's, it's a big issue. And honestly, if some customer goes down because somebody's sending two terabits of traffic at them, I think we'd all understand, right? Uh, my issue with this number is the way that it's been flogged uh, in marketing, right? Everybody and their grandma blogged about this, right? I'm, I'm guilty too. <laughs> um, and especially when you look at statistics, there is a 500% increase in the average DDoS attack size last year. No, there wasn't. I mean, there's two outliers here, right? And these numbers are being used to essentially scare the bejesus out of people to be able to buy stuff, right? And that's something, the nice thing about making your own company is I don't have to follow what somebody in Silicon Valley tells me to say to my poor unsuspecting customers, right? So this is what I actually tell people, right? That was so widely covered right? But the coverage of that is not the likelihood of that event happening, right? So how do you address that strategically? I mean, if you look at the median DDoS attack size, it's somewhere around one and a half gigs. Okay, that's, that's definitely something that uh, most organizations should at least be thinking about and ideally running a live test against their production environment to make sure they can handle something like that, right? So the coverage of something is not likelihood, right? Nobody's talking very much about uh, the things that happen to every organization every single day. Um, no, because we're all nerds and we like numbers and 1.7 is really cool, right? That being said, an event like that is really severe. It will cause problems across wide swaths of the internet. It will take down networks but that doesn't mean it happens every day. Sure, you should think about this in your risk analysis, right? But you should not build your entire infrastructure around, uh, around the fact that you need to be able to deal with this. That's our job, right? But our customers shouldn't need to think about that. It's, it's sort of like if I build my, uh, my home alarm system in the eventuality that, I don't know, psychotic clowns are gonna come in and take over things. Do I have things to detect squeaky shoes or some, some nonsense like that, right? It's, it's not in my scope of reality. Instead, um, if you look at this ENISA report, and I realize it's a, it's a little old, I need to update these slides, but I found this really interesting. More than half of the DDoS attacks that they saw going towards different customers were just distractions, right? Because uh, DDoSes, like myself or the president of my home country, are very loud, annoying, pain in the, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of bitter. I don't want to get political all of a sudden. Um, but they're smoke screens for these kind of things, right? 
I'm going to make a lot of noise and say, watch what my right hand is doing while I'm trying to steal data with the left hand. This is the most common thing that we see, more than half, right? And so with strategy in mind, how do we build a strategy to actually protect against those kind of things, right? Uh, how many of you are familiar with defense in depth? All right. Of course you are. <laughs> um, so defense in depth has been the kind of enterprise security strategy since time immemorial, right? The, the term defense in depth and the whole concept actually goes back to Roman times, right? So it's a very old tried and true uh, method, right? And we all know that while we were using this methodology, nobody ever got hacked, all networks were fine, and we all lived in peace and harmony and unicorns and stuff, right? Okay, my jokes aren't working. Help. <laughs> so the, the core premise of defense in depth is I need to protect my network, and I don't trust any of my individual vendors, right? So I'm going to set up a firewall. And the stuff that gets through the firewall, I'm going to put up an uh, intrusion prevention system to detect stuff that goes through there. And then I'll set up a proxy and then some other solution. And hopefully, there'll be enough overlap in the middle that I won't ever get hacked and everything will be detected, or at least I'll be aware of the problem. right? And this was really the only strategy we, in the security side of things, had for a long time. And most ops rooms look something like this, right? Everything is fine, right? There are no problems. Uh, we, shh, we don't want to know. I've actually been to customers who didn't want to install visibility solutions because they were afraid of what it would show them. That's one security strategy, I suppose. But in 2010, there was a paper released by Lockheed Martin and a guy by the name of Eric Hutchins. And this paper, which has a really long, boring title, right? I only got 15 minutes here, so I don't have time to read it. Um, that is loosely called the Kill Chain paper, right? And this paper changed the way that us on the security side think about solving the problem of delivering security, right? And you'll notice if you go back to like 2011, you'll notice a shift in every security vendor who said, oh, this actually makes sense. Right? And at its core, what the kill chain said is no matter who the attacker is or who the victim is, there are seven steps that the bad guys need to do to be able to achieve their objective, right? They need to do some recon. Uh, I myself prefer the super awesome hacker tools of Facebook and LinkedIn, right? To be able to gather my intel, find the vulnerability in the organization. Then I need to weaponize that. Hook is into uh, kayaking, right? So I'm going to send him an uh, email with a link. That's my delivery. Please click on my link. And I know nobody ever clicks on links and emails. Um, then when he clicks it, it explodes, installs some sort of badness, uh, and then reaches back to me and says, hey, I'm ready. right? And then I can start moving laterally throughout the organization and do whatever my actions are. right? Sometimes those actions might be something like, I just want to steal his data. Uh, sometimes I just want to use his assets as my own to, I don't, why is mining uh, crypto coins so popular? It's the hardest work for like five bucks I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> um, so no matter what, this is the pattern that attacks follow. So the checks there are the checks where we at Baffin Bay Networks feel that we can provide insight, protection, and visibility into these specific parts. Right? I can't do anything about a guy sitting around uh, writing some malware. Uh, we can send Hoogie out if you get an address. Um, I can't stop you from clicking on the link. But we can provide protection across those different ones. And that's the core of the strategy. Right? The, the DDoS attack comes. And then this stuff happens. We want to be able to protect both sides of that at the same time. So instead of looking at security as providing a castle and building up my walls and moats and all my protections around it, 
we've flipped the script based on the back of this research, and now we're looking at the attacker playbook. If you know where he's going to be, and you know what his next step is, then you can get out in front of it and be proactive instead of just running around playing whack-a-mole with your security. There is a problem, however. There's seven steps, and we're all kind of nerds, and generally, or I don't speak for you, but I am. Um, generally speaking, we have a technology problem in the, the technology industry, right? We like new shiny toys. Hoogies are more expensive than mine. And this is sort of what the modern security toolbox looks like, right? Uh, on the back end of the kill chain, we started seeing a proliferation of tools. The average organization in the US has somewhere between 80 and 300 different security tools, right? That's expensive. That is, there's no way you're going to have enough people to be experts in all of those tools. And so when something bad happens, you run out to the tool shed and you say, uh, give me that. I think this is the right tool for this job. Uh, the guy, Stefan, who uh, worked here 10 years ago was the guy who actually bought it and knew how to use it and went to the training. But we'll figure it out. We got a manual, right? That's what's happening in a lot of organizations today. And so what you see now is the backlash to that. Uh, a lot of people moving towards next generation firewalls. It's also why I don't work for a company where I sell standalone IPSs. It's a lonely job these days, right? Um, so you see the, uh, the proliferation of m kind of UTM or multiple tools in one box. And that is the methodology that we've built our solution Riverview around, right? Yes, DDoS, the big pointy end, right? That's what brings people, and that's usually what starts a conversation, right? Hopefully, it's not a conversation of, our network is down, please help us, although we have done that in the past. But in addition to just that one core problem, we also add a set of tools for web application pr uh, protection, right? So if you look here, I've, I'd say DDoS, unless you're like, I don't know, WikiLeaks or a crypto exchange, DDoS tends to be fairly low prevalence. It doesn't happen very often, but when it does, it's pretty bad. Contrast to that, uh, attacks against the websites uh, or internet-facing assets happen all the time, right? In the course of this presentation, I'm sure I've gotten five or 10 against our main website just from the general background noise of the internet. But if it happens, it's gonna have a high impact, right? Uh, as one of the 180-some million Americans whose financial data was leaked, uh, it, it has pretty bad impacts, right? I got free credit uh, reporting, though, so that's great. Uh, we've also added in threat protection, right? This is your IPS, uh, your anti-malware, sandboxing, right? Again, malware, these kind of attacks happen all the time, right? And if they are successful, they have a tremendously high impact. And we back that all up with threat intelligence, where we have our threat intel team gather in kind of uh, IP reputation today. We're looking at expanding that to be able to say, we know this set of IPs is a botnet. Do you want that coming in your network? Probably not. Uh, especially as more of our customers start moving towards cloud, right? Reducing the amount of CPU and bandwidth and that kind of stuff has a direct financial impact for that organization. So how does this all work? Um, Hoog is going to talk about what exists in this shiny cloud in the middle, right? Uh, I believe there's magic and unicorns. Yes. Um, essentially, we can route traffic or proxy using uh, DNS redirection through our cloud. We have all the multiple different uh, inspection engines, right? Threat intelligence, uh, machine learning to do the denial of service and network profiling. And then selectively, if a customer has assets that they want to bump up to layer seven, we can then provide web application protection, threat inspection for things, uh, even if they have multiple ISPs, right? And for those of you who are on this part, we also uh, can do white labeling. So uh, currently today, a lot of our customers buy it from one ISP and are looking to multi-home. And the ISP1 has no ability to protect ISP2's network, right? 
because that's how it works. <laughs> and we allow them to push that out a little bit. And by doing that, we can protect against multi-homed uh, attacks. We can also protect against cloud assets, uh, protect those cloud assets all in one solution. Um, because we're focused on strategy, integration is something that we take very seriously, right? So all the, the logs, all the data that we have here, we don't want it, right? We collect it, but we want our customers to have that because the more information you can dump into whatever SIM solution you have, the more analytics you can run on that, the better you can be at getting out and doing actual proactive security work. Right? If you see an increase in sessions coming from, I don't know, Uzbekistan, right? that for me as a security guy and probably for you as network folk is an anomaly that warrants further investigation. Right? And then we can actually go and do that and we provide all, that logs, all those logs to do that. For customers who don't want to route through us, we integrate with the router switches, uh, Fortinet, and a couple of other things to be able to send signals to us. Hey, I'm in trouble. And then start routing things during that time. We've got a lot of other integrations uh, underway. Uh, but before I uh, start talking about all of those, uh, I will run out of time. So I'll just keep going on here. So what I want you to take away from this, even if you never talk to any of us again, although why wouldn't you want to talk to again? Um, coherent strategy from a security side is the best asset. I don't care how much budget you've spent on fancy shiny toys. Uh, if you don't back that up with having a strategy on how to use that, it's just a waste of money, right? And having had this experience sitting on the customer side, that is the methodology that I want to bring into Baffin Bay Networks as we're thinking of ours. Uh, of our solution. Um, marketing people lie. <laughs> I, I know you're all shocked. <gasps> Clutch your pearls, right? Um, don't trust marketing to tell you what to worry about, right? Look at what traffic you're seeing. Look at where your risks are. Do things in production environment. Break stuff, I mean off hours, but break stuff in production environment. Um, because if not, it doesn't matter how many millions of crowns you've spent on security infrastructure. If you don't test it to know it works, it probably won't. And finally, uh, to avoid that t bloat of tools and having all those things that you're paying maintenance for that you're not actually using, try to find things that can serve multi multiple purposes Look for things that can actually deliver your main goal and an additional suite of benefits, whether you're licensing those or borrowing those or, or not using them today. Having that option will be useful when you get that call at 3 o'clock in the morning on some Saturday and you need to start putting things into place. And so with that, that finishes my presentation. I will be around here uh, for the rest of the day and night and stuff. So if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, come up and talk to any of us from the Baffin Bay Networks team. And now I'd like to bring uh, my lovely assistant, Hugge, <laughs> up. Yeah, I give Jason applause. Such a charming guy, right? We have to go all the way to the US to find him. Yeah, so I'm Freddy Korsbeck, typically known as Hugge, and people typically know me as, as uh, the guy that uh, does Sunet and Nordnet stuff, which I still do. Uh, that is my day job, and uh, now I'm here to talk about my night job, um, which is uh, Baffin Bay Networks, which, where I'm doing network strategy, or, or sometimes I'm referred to as the CTO, and sometimes it's referred to the annoying guy that just destroys everyone's plans. Um, so I, I, want, I wanted to start this with, with actually an... Um, a meme that got, just got slammed by Bonhoff that they couldn't use it because it was sexistic in, in, in advertising. So I thought, hey, free marketing um, for us as well, so we can use the same thing. Um, so yeah, as you know, we're a Swedish startup. Uh, we were founded in 2016 with angel investors uh, that helped us out to get started. Uh, Joachim Sundberg was the guy that started it. Uh, 
you probably met him before if you worked with Juniper Gear or, or um, Sourcefire or F5, F5 Gear. Uh, the first ICMP Echo reply was about 2017 when we got the first, uh, the first site up. And uh, now here in 2018, we got uh, with um, a round investment from EQT Ventures, uh, which puts us in very good shape to uh, build out the network and to ex execute on the strategy that we previously had. Um, as you've seen, we've not been able to buy the Office package yet, so I had to dig out an old license for PowerPoint 97. Uh, so we can make this uh, to, to make sure that we use our startup money for the right things, which is to buy network gear and not to buy the office package. Uh, our office is just uh, up the street here in Regeringsgatan on SAP 46 on the incubator. Uh, it looks like an incubator, like every incubator. There's ping pong tables, there's foosball, people drinking this fancy cola because Coca Cola is not good enough, so you need to drink like what's it called the yellow Coca Cola. It's disgusting. And people eating like poke balls and avocado salads and stuff like that. So, so I don't spend very much time there. Because, uh, <laughs> yeah, and people with, you know, with these hats that is not, uh, and pants that are not long enough. Um, super weird. Uh, we also need a new office. We're super cramped where we are. So if you have any suggestions or if anyone plans on going bankrupt, we can probably take out that office. That would be great. Uh, we would like it to be in central Stockholm, uh, not out in Schist or in the suburbs. So that would be great. So I'm here to talk about network strategy. I'm here to talk about platform and how we do all this stuff. Uh, as, as always, if you have seen me before, I will always be very you know, gonzo and upfront about everything. So please ask, and I will probably answer whatever questions you have. So the platform is quite easy. It would be, I mean, it's a platform that looks like a platform uh, you could expect. Uh, and that looks pretty much like our competitors as well in terms of uh, uh, the overall uh, how we build it. So we typically refer as that we have a north side where we does routing, so that is the dirty side. That's the outside of things where we connect transit, PNIs, IXPs, and everything. Uh, we operate the public A's number, of course, and um, we have two deployment models. We have a bunch more, but these are the two main ones, and then there's a combinations between here. Um, so the north side routing is 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 big big routers taking a lot of capacity, make sure that we never get congested. And then we have this magic unicorn stuff, which, which is a lot of really skillful developers is working on uh, day and night to make better. It's, a, it's a, essentially a mix of x86 servers and FPGAs, uh, depending on what we need to do. For example, the, the, the DPI platform is, is built upon x86, and, uh, and some of the layer 4 mitigation is built upon FPGAs. Uh, and and uh, we can probably talk about what exists in that with an NDA, I guess. Um, but, but uh, it is working quite well. And then we have a south side routing where we typically hand off to customers. And depending on which type of deployment module you have, we hand off either with the direct fiber, which is great if we happen to be in the same data centers. Uh, the typical deployment would be with GRE, uh, or just over the internet, to get routed traffic back to someone. Uh, or any other combination. I mean, we can do VXLAN, we can do a bunch of other stuff. Uh, what, what, whatever you need, we can most likely do in the south, uh, south side. Uh, the other type of deployment is, is a proxy model, uh, where you essentially lift out your, uh, your SSL certs out to our AnyCost proxy end. Works like any AnyCost proxy you could, you could, you could imagine. Uh, but since we do interception of certs here, then we can do all the things up to layer 7. And this is deployed, of course, on every site that we have. So the more sites we add, the better the service will be. Uh, and, and you still keep your backend data wherever you are and uh, we just proxy it through our uh, network. So that's kind of what we need to understand to be able to understand the next slides, which is the strategy part where I did. Uh, like, why did we choose what we choose? Because, I mean, this room is full of network people, not security people, so I don't want to bore you with security stuff, like James just did. <laughs> so the first thing, because, I mean, one and a half year ago, this company didn't have anything, right? So we needed to build something really fast, and we needed to build it Big. I mean, we needed. We aimed for seven sites the first year. Um, the first thing you need when you build a site is collocation and hosting. So this is actually my notes uh, from 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 way back when, when we tried to decide where to go, how do we do it, what's the pros and cons of everything. I know this is very you know upfront here with with you guys, but I think it could be useful for for people that are in the same situation as we are that you need to build something. So there is a few players on the global market, or, or at least, I mean, we're quite Europe-centric, but we do have a global presence. So I guess the most, uh, the most obvious one is Equinix, which is 
pretty much everywhere, especially when they bought Telecity uh, and, and they bought companies all over the time. And it's a few good things with that. They have a global presence. Equinix has a data center in almost every city in the world, at least almost every city that is relevant, at least. Uh, you get a lot of free market from Equinix. I mean, you probably get the emails which you put in the, in the, in the trash immediately, at least that's what I do. That like, yeah, new, uh, oh, it's a new ISP that does cool stuff here in, uh, in Equinix Singapore. It's like, go to trash. Um, so, so that could be useful to get that free marketing. Um, they do have some useful platforms. I mean, because Equi Equinix is quite much more than a data center. They're also a, a, a provider. Um, so they have like uh, the cloud, cloud exchange, for example. I think that could be useful. I think that's, that's, that's an that's a OK service. Um, could be used. Um, Sheep IXPs, as you know, I mean, uh, the, the water cooler banter is, is that you get free IXPs if you connect to Equinix, which, which is more or less true. Uh, you get a single CSM, so you can have a, a one account manager for all the sites, which, are kind of, which is very useful for us since, I mean, I'm doing this on, on, on my night time, right? So ha having to deal with just one CSM is great. Uh, they have really good network density overall. Uh, there's typically quite filled data centers. Uh, there's a few bad things with Equinix as well. I mean, they have some really shitty DCs. Uh, maybe people here in Stockholm recognize a few of them. Uh, it's uh, a bit north of the city. Uh, they are quite expensive. Uh, typically, those are the ones that are, give us the highest quotes. Um, they compete with customers. Uh, with the cell transit services, they sell uh, metro wave services, they sell security services, they sell a lot of things. So, in my book, Equinix is not the carrier neutral data center anymore, but uh, it can still be useful. And there is some skill gap between sites, and uh, this is mainly in terms of field engineers. There's a few sites where I simply don't trust uh, the hands and feet to do a job for me. I go there myself. Um, interaction. Is is uh, really nice DCs. Typically, I've been in seven of them. All of them has been really nice. Uh, they have decent pricing. Uh, they have a better portal, good engineers, but they're only in Europe. So, if you want to build fast and build quick, then you need multiple CSMs. You need multiple contracts. Sign multiple MSAs. Sign multiple of everything. If you don't, can go with a single vendor. Uh, so, yeah, they don't have good good enough cor uh, coverage. Telehouse is also something. Uh, they have a decent global presence, a bit, bit bigger than, uh, than Interaction. They have decent pricing, but they don't have anything here in, in North Europe, which is, which is a problem for us since we started out here. Um, so it was not a very natural choice for us. They can also go with telco hosting. I mean, you can host with TLA or Entity or, or, or anyone else. Um, typically cheap if you buy other stuff from, from that telco. But the network density in those sites are really crappy. You typically only have one big transit provider, and, and we like to have at least three. Um, requires metro connectivity to get out. Uh, we can't really pick up customers in, in any big essence on those sites. And the quality varies all over the place. I mean, there are some really new fancy data centers, some really old crappy ones, which you, you're lucky if you can even get in before you get bitten by rats. Um, then there's a few independent ones. That's actually where we started. I mean, we started with uh, Gliasis in Vestberia. A uh, very nice data center where I can recommend everyone that needs to start up with something to uh, talk with those guys. Uh, typically, always or almost cheap. Uh, typically good engineers, typically good locations because they typically want to compete with someone. But there is a lot of administration, a lot of scoping out, you know, portal accounts, CSMs, all of that. So if you were to have a global strategy to go with independent data centers, then you probably need another guy just to take care of administration, which we don't have the people for. So, uh, for these first sites that we built, we went with Equinix. We'll see what uh, the future holds. If we get more people and, and more money, then we have, have the time and effort to, to perhaps select the best site in every metro instead of just going with the Equinix site that is currently available. Because I, I truly don't believe that Equinix is, is, is best in each city. There's probably a lot of other cities where another choice would be more successful. Okay, then we need something to put in here. Um, so there's a few equipment. I mean, there was a very short like requirement that we had that all right, how to build a platform, we need a few things. So on the north side, or the outside, or the, the this where we connect with other ISPs, I mean, we need cheap 100 gig. I mean, everything is 100 gig these days. Uh, we need full BGP routing, which means full tables, IPv4 and IPv6. They need to be a small footprint because we don't want to give uh, that much money to Equinix. We need them to be cheap. We only need them to essentially be bit shufflers. We don't need them to do magic stuff like you know subscriber management or something like that. They just need to sh shuffle bits. 
Uh, they need big buffers so we can do speed conversion and that we don't lose packets. They need to be able to do a lot of ACLs. Flow spec was, uh, was uh, nice to have. Uh, of course, NetFlow and SFlow, because we need to, to do visualization of every traffic that goes in and out of our network. So, so, so NetFlow support is mandatory. And since we have 10 developers, but only one networking guy, I mean, the, net, the, the network is not going to be controlled by me, it's going to be controlled by the developers, that, and they need an API of some sort. So it can't be like an old Cisco switch, which has CLI scraping as the API. We need a proper API. On the south side, we have a bit different skill set. Uh, we want to be do flexible interconnect, and with that I mean we need to do 1 gig, 40 gigs, 100 gigs, 10 gigs, and all sorts of in-between so we can make sure that we don't lose a customer based upon that we couldn't do 1 gig long haul, um, because we don't know what the customer likes. So we need to do flexible interconnect. We also need to, to be able to do a lot of GREs, since that is where low bandwidth routed customers will typically come in. Uh, it needs to be able to do VRFs, uh, MSS adjustment because of that uh, GE tunneling. It also needs to have APIs. It needs to have all the port co combinations. It also needs to be, of course, cheap. So what we ended up with was a list that looked something like this, the pointer here. Um, so this, this was what was available at the market. Please bear in mind that it was one and a half year ago where we kind of set the strategy. Um, so a lot of uh, small th things have changed since then, uh, but I think it still could be relevant information if you need to do something like this uh, as well. Um, so these are the platforms. I mean, it's a mix of, of classical ISP routers and more modern, um, uh, you know, like the Aristas and the Cisco and, and the NCS, which are Jericho-based Broadcom boxes. Uh, that's typically come from the cloud, I call people. So there's a few things we can Im almost immediately uh, cross out, and that is, that is the classic ASRs, uh, the classic uh, MX, also the new MX, actually, uh, the Huawei Net Engines, and the uh, Nokia 7750, which is also a quite classical big ISP router. And yes, they are expensive to buy, but they're also quite expensive to operate. They are typically chassis-based. They are typically very heavy on licensing and support costs. They take a lot of power because, I mean, if you work with Equinix, you know that they are really good at charging for power. Um, so, so we kind of crossed them out immediately. I mean, we of course have them in the evaluation, but we couldn't really see them fit in the beginning. So they were the first ones to go out. Next one is, is, the, is the hipster stuff in the bottom. Uh, so that's the white box. A white box is still, uh, it is maybe something we need to do in the future. Uh, but at the time, it was not really something that we that we that we felt that we could believe in. I mean, we could buy edge cord switches with with uh, Pika OS or or IP Infusion, but the amount of time to be able to work with that and actually make sure that it's stable, I'd rather have to pay a vendor for that than to pay uh, myself for that because I, I I don't have time for this anyway. So, and then the brocade stuff, which was at the time extremely uncertain because they went bankrupt, uh, were bought later by Extreme. It was very unclear what the future was for brocade, so they were also immediately crossed out because of uncertainty of the actual product. Um, so we're starting to get the list down. Um, the Huawei uh, Cloud Engine 6800, I was a bit actually interested in that, but turns out that it will not be productified as a BG BGP router. It is, a, um, it is a Jericho box, but they will not do full tables, they will not put in external TCAM, so they will only uh, target it as a, as, a, as, as a cloud box, which was a bit uh, sad, because it's always good you know, when you do tenders and when you do this stuff to always have Huawei in the, in the mix, because that makes sure to keep uh, Juniper and Cisco honest with pricing if they know that Huawei is also competing. It's a good trick for everyone. Um, there, all right. Then there's a few more. They're, the, they're both Cisco boxes in the top, so the Cisco NCS 5500. 5500 is also a uh, Jericho-based or Qumran-based box. Uh, but it was, uh, it was not out in Q1 2017. It was not, not available. ASR 9901 was not available either. Uh, that, that, that is a, oh, so that's the, their own chip, but it is a small for, uh, form factor box, uh, which looks really good. Uh, have a really interesting port combination. We're probably a good box for both our north and south side. But it was not available at Q1. Uh, I think it came in Q3 or something like that, so it was a bit unfortunate. So that is, that we've got two boxes here uh, that was left, that was, that was, that was um, still left on the list. And we decided to put these on different places. So, first, the uh, Juniper MX, I mean, that is a fully featured MX, like any MX you would ever know, but it is very small, and 
the good thing with that is that it has all the functions that typical MX has. So it does all the VRFs, it does all the configuration, it does all the stuff that you're, you're used to when you're working with Juniper. Um, and, and, and that is good, especially you know, on the south side, because then we know that GREs, for example, will work great. That was not the thing with Arista. That, I mean, it works now, but at the time, it was very flaky to do GREs on, on these Aristas. Um, then, of course, the Arista, perfect box for, our, for, for on the north side. I mean, it is, it is very dense, has a lot of ports. It's available in many flavors with 10 gigs or 100 gigs or 40 gigs or whatever. Uh, it is cheap. Um, it is, it is uh, maybe not so cheap as everyone thinks, but, but uh, the pricing equivalent is, is about seven beers for 100 gig. That depends on what, which beer you buy, right? But, but uh, uh, it, is, it is a little bit cheaper than MX, um, which, is, which is good uh, for us. So, so we have like a feature-rich south side with not as much bandwidth, and we have a maybe not so much feature on the north side, but with a lot of bandwidth, which is kind of the point of, of uh, what we were doing. Uh, so that is the current setup uh, on the networking part, what we did. Then, of course, the whole unicorn part in the middle. That's, I'm not going to talk about that, but it's, as I said, it's a mix of FPGAs and x86 servers. Um, right. Did I mention something? No. Okay. Then the next thing, you need con connectivity to be able to do this. And you probably need all kinds of con connectivity. Um, of course, we select sites based upon where there's other people. I mean, we need to be in the in the core of the internet. I think is the is the word that's used around this place. Um, so we need IXPs. We need really good uh, transit connectivity, and we need to be able to do PNIs. So the IXPs. Why we even selected to go with IXPs? I, I mean, I assume most of the people in the room is aware of what an IXP is. But what we wanted to do, or what the, what value the IXPs brings to us in this project, is diversity. Of course, we want to be able to have many paths in and out of our network. Uh, we think that selective peering is great. Uh, if if you if you talked with me before, you know that I'm I'm strongly against open peering. Uh, that 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 uh, that uh, good selective peering is probably the way to go for everyone, depending on or regardless of size. So having IXPs where you can set up bilateral peering with whoever you want is a great choice to be able to also steer risk for us. Uh, they are, however, quite expensive per megabit um, because you pay the whole capacity up front. As far as I know, there is no uh, IXPs that sell ports on a CDR basis. Two minutes, really. All right. Um, transit has a lot of really positive things. You can buy really big pipes with small commits, which is what we're doing. Uh, they can be diverse if, if you want them to, if you pay for it. They can have free mitigation procedures, which could be of use for us. For example, the whole mem memcache thing, that would be great if we can stop that far out in the network. Uh, Transit also functions as a backbone, which is exactly how it functions in our case, that we, that we try to use Transit with tunnels uh, as backbone, because we don't really need a backbone. I mean, like any CDN or any of these cloud services uh, uh, that looks like us, they don't really need um, backbone for anything. You just use it at Transit. I think there was a presentation two or three years ago about Spotify that they did everything with tunnels. Uh, and just try to measure in the tunnel and see which, which one was good. And this, this actually does a lot, this works better than you would imagine. Uh, there's a significant difference in quality here. I mean, there, there is, there's really highs and lows in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the transit business. Some of them are really good, some of them are, are really crappy, you can't ever use. Then you have, of course, PNIs. They are very, very driven by cross-connect pricing. And like, for example, in the US, it is commonplace that a cross-connect is $350 a month per cross-connect. Building PNIs on that cost basis, that's, 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 that doesn't work. Then you probably use the IEXPs much more than you would do. Than, than you would do. Then there's actually, it's actually worth upgrading IEXPs. Uh, it could also be hard to fulfill uh, requirement volumes being small. I mean, we're small. We didn't exist one year ago. Now we exist. So we don't have massive volumes. And the cost of administration is not to be overlooked. I mean, uh, some of these, these places, I mean, you, you, can, you spend hours doing Excels for Equinix to get the cross-connect going. Uh, that should not be overlooked. It could actually be quite costly. So that's also uh, uh, one thing for the IXPs, which is positive. You just do it once, and then you just run it, run it over there. Then there is some fun with flags. So when we select sites, we want to, as I said, be at the core of the internet. So the first sites that we built now, we built two in Stockholm. We built Amsterdam, Frankfurt, New York, Los Angeles, and Singapore. I guess these are the most obvious places where you build these type of services, because those are the big exchange points of the internet in the world. 
Uh, for 2019, we have a plan of doing Copenhagen. Uh, London uh, is also great. I mean, we will see what happens with London, with the whole Brexit thing, if the finance people just moves away. But I still think that London will be uh, very relevant to do uh, peering in sites. Uh, Dallas and Ashburn, I guess, is very, also very obvious. Ashburn being the biggest place in the US uh, to do peering. Dallas is a really good um, yeah, like Central, uh, Central American place to do business. Chicago is a competitor, I would say. Hong Kong is great to reach uh, South, uh, South Asia, also to get some traffic into China, or rather get the traffic from China, maybe, is the most interesting part here. Tokyo is also great, really good connectivity, quite cheap, quite a good competition, local. Uh, and then, of course, Paris, uh, which is, which is up and coming, I would say, on, on being relevant again. And 2020, then there's more weird places, which happens. Marseille is good, really good if you want to push traffic into Africa. Uh, inside China is great if you want to stop the DDoS uh, where it started. Uh, <laughs> Johannesburg is if you want to cover South Africa. Uh, it's becoming the, the, the focal point for all South African traffic, or uh, the continent of, uh, of Africa, the South, Southern Africa. Sydney is also interesting if you want to do something in Oceania. Uh, Moscow, if you want to also stop the DDoX attacks where they happen, and also to get the grasp on Russian markets. Uh, Sao Paulo uh, for um, South America. Lagos also for Africa. Uh, Mumbai and Dubai is also good options if you want to if you want to open up new markets. Essentially, uh, we'll see what happens with that. But but uh, that is at least uh, what's in my head currently for this project. Um, I'm a bit late, but not that late that I was expecting, so that's good. Uh, there's some credits, so yeah, the website, it looks like shit, but it's, uh, now that we have money, we actually paid a firm to, to make a new website for us. Uh, you can email James if you want to know any, anything. Uh, you can come play ping pong up at Sub46. Uh, it's great if you want to eat avocados and play ping pong. Uh, you can watch our YouTube channel. Uh, there is, you can, if, you, if you need more of James, he's, he's available in the YouTube channel with his, uh, with his American accent. Uh, we have Jürgen Stadia who's written an article in Swedish quite in depth about what we do on his web blog. So there's, uh, there's a short link there um, that goes to technikaliteter.se, uh, which is it's in Swedish. But, uh, but um, yeah, I think most people should share anyway. Uh, we also uh, we need a lot of developers, so if you have spare developers, which no one has, then uh, please send them our way. Uh, we we play with those. <laughs> we we can pay with avocados and some money. Uh, and also, yeah, don't forget to like us on GeoCities and MySpace. And uh, maybe I can afford to buy the new Office package soon. But uh, well, I really like these clippers, though. Uh, that's it for me. Um, I don't know if there's questions. Otherwise, please go drink our coffee that we paid for. Uh, <laughs> I, hope, I hope that it's fine. So um, we're going into the coffee break now. So if you do have any questions for James or Hugo, please catch them in the coffee break. But for now, uh, join me in thanking them for a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much, guys.